And so you know that little Sunday school class where you taught children about Jesus throughout the year? In God's eyes, that is far more important than the house you're paying off. Hey, you know your Bible study group where you sit around and you've been talking about Jesus throughout the year? In God's eyes, that is far more significant than how your job has progressed throughout the year. We want to be like that because we are convinced that he truly is the centre of all things. We want to be like that because we're convinced that he is the one. He is the king that God promised. He is David's descendant, the one who rules over God's special people in order to bring blessings to all the world. We want to be a church where the stuff that matters most is the stuff to do with Jesus. Thanks heaps, Jonathan. And um, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David. Lovely to be with you. And hey, just eight sleeps till Christmas, like James already said, not long to go now. I wonder um, how prepared you're feeling. Not sure if this will help or perhaps if it'll rub salt into the wounds at this late stage, but a little while back I found this uh, Christmas preparation checklist. Should I have a picture here? There we go. Christmas preparation checklist. Evidently, you too can plan for a stress-free Christmas by starting your preparations early and following this comprehensive checklist. So according to the checklist, uh, eight weeks before Christmas, that's the time you should take a family snap for the Christmas card. Five weeks out, you should do a Christmas supplies inventory check. To be honest, I'm not even sure what that means. <laughs> At the beginning of December, uh, that's the time to buy and decorate your Christmas tree. It's also the time to make use of, you know, the Black Friday sales to snag some bargains on gifts. <laughs> Apparently last week, that, uh, two weeks out, that was the ideal time to plan your Christmas Day menu and to kind of organise a cooking timeline. But don't worry, if you're a bit behind the eight ball and you haven't done any of that, According to the checklist, this afternoon is the time to go grocery shopping, put up your Christmas stockings and freeze some meals for the big day. And then this week, uh, wrap your presents, get your favourite uh, Christmas tunes together in a playlist before next weekend settling down in front of the telly for a Christmas movie marathon. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like a lot of preparation for Christmas. What we're going to see today, though, in the bit of the Bible that Jonathan just read for us, with that long list of names, what we're seeing is that preparations for the very first Christmas, they started not weeks early, not months early, but actually thousands of years earlier. In fact, what we'll see in today's passage is that God had been shaping the entire history of the world in preparation for the birth of Jesus. Jesus so that when he finally arrived, there would be no mistake as to who he was and why he had come. And Matthew shows us these extraordinary preparations by starting his gospel with a remarkable family tree. It's a family tree that he introduces to us by way of an intriguing opening sentence. So look with me there. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, what's intriguing about that opening sentence, I reckon, is why does it specifically mention David and Abraham there? I mean, as we get into the genealogy proper, Matthew's going to mention both of them again. So why drag them right up the front here so they get mentioned twice? And anyway, why those two particular blokes? I mean, why didn't he go for someone like Judah? Why didn't he go for someone like King Solomon? What's so special about these two guys? Well, it's because from the very start of his gospel here, Matthew wants to focus our attention on how Jesus' birth comes as the fulfilment of God's plans to make things right in the world. See, in the opening chapters of the Bible, right back near the beginning, it very quickly becomes obvious that there is a lot wrong with the world. I mean, just a few chapters in, we read about a guy who kills his brother in cold blood and tries to cover it up. A few chapters later, we read about another guy who gets drunk and exposes himself to his sons. And pretty quickly, after a few chapters later, that sort of behaviour, it becomes commonplace. People lie to one another and they deceive each other and they cheat one another. 
People take other people as captives and they put them in slavery. And there's just this gross injustice in the world. And chapter after chapter, death just spreads everywhere, seemingly unchecked. And soon we read about entire towns and cities being wiped out and razed to the ground. And it reaches a point before long that it becomes so despicable, so utterly disgusting that we're told that God, he regretted that he'd ever made people in the first place. The earth was corrupt in God's sight, we're told. It was just full of violence and wickedness and evil. It is a black, black picture. I remember talking with a friend a while back and he was telling me about a time when uh, he was a boy and he went with his dad to see a surgeon. His dad had been suffering for months with this terrible pain running down his body from a problem in his neck. And my friend said he can remember going into the doctor's surgery and seeing the doctor sitting there uh, behind the desk, uh, looking at his dad's x-rays, studying the scans, not saying anything. And then after what seemed like ages, uh, my friend said the doctor looked up. He looked at my friend's dad and he said, would you like me to stop the pain? My friend said that up until that point, he'd never really seen his dad show much emotion at all. But when the doctor said that, he just started crying. To hear someone who could help promise that they were going to, my friend's dad just wept. And I tell you, friends, that is the sort of feeling that washes through the Old Testament when God makes some incredibly wonderful promises to Abraham and David promises to make things right i mean to abraham god promised to abraham that he would have many descendants and god also promised that out of abraham's descendants he would uh, would come an especially blessed people a people who god would call his very own a people who god would use to bring blessings to the entire world but all that wasn't enough because a bit later on in the old testament god made even more promises to david When he was king over Abraham's descendants, God promised King David that one of his descendants, one of David's descendants, would be the ruler over this blessed people of God. And if that wasn't enough, as we keep reading on through the Old Testament, it became clear that this promised ruler, this descendant of David, would in fact be the ruler over all the world. And he would judge with justice and righteousness and peace. And he'd eventually bring rest to this special blessed people of God. And so a special people of God ruled over by a special ruler of God, so as to bring blessings to all the earth, they are pretty big promises that God made to Abraham and David. Remarkably big promises actually coming as they do in the midst of a world that was spiralling out of control. Against this backdrop of a messy, corrupt, violent world, God just breaks in and he promises to fix things up. He promises to create a blessed people, ruled over by a wonderful king. It's a commitment from someone who can help to do exactly that, to help the world. And look, back here in Matthew, by especially reminding us of David and Abraham here in the very first sentence, do you see that Matthew is building anticipation already for where this genealogy might be getting us to? I mean, could this genealogy actually be leading us to the person who will in fact fulfil all these wonderful promises that God made to Abraham and David. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Because what we quickly discover when you start to read the genealogy itself is that it turns out to be a pretty unusual genealogy. And at least a couple of the things that make it unusual also help to build this anticipation as to where the genealogy might be heading. So, for example, one of the unusual things about this genealogy, you might have noticed, as Jonathan read for us before, is that women get mentioned in it. So you look at verse 2, for example, where it kicks off fairly conventionally with Abraham. Verse 2. Abraham, that's a bloke, was the father of Isaac, another bloke. Isaac, the father of Jacob, that's another bloke. Jacob, the father of Judah, another guy, and his brothers, that's more blokes. Verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez, another guy, and Zerah, another bloke, whose mother was Tamar. Like, where'd she come from? Why drop her into this list? 
Then down in verse 5, don't know if you noticed, there's another woman, Rahab gets mentioned. And actually in the same verse, a third woman, Ruth, gets mentioned there. Now you've got to know that in the male-dominated world that Matthew was writing in, this is very unusual, this is very unconventional to mention women in a family tree. But it's also an unusual choice of women when you think about it. I mean, there's no mention of the ones that you might expect. Like Abraham's wife, Sarah, for example, not a mention. There's just Tamar, Rahab and Ruth. Which, if you're at all familiar with your Old Testament, you'll recognise they are all Gentile women. They're not part of Israel. They're all women who married into Abraham's descendants. Actually, on top of that, a couple of them are quite dubious Gentile women. Rahab, you might remember, was a prostitute from Jericho. And Tamar was a Canaanite who pretended to be a prostitute so as to seduce her own father-in-law. But you see, Matthew is deliberately mentioning them in this genealogy to again remind us of God's promises to create a special people who will bring blessing to all the world. A people who will bring blessings to Jews and Gentiles. A people who will bring blessing to men and women. A people who will bring blessing even to broken people. Even to unexpected people. Even to undeserving people. Because as you look down the genealogy, that's exactly the types of people who get included in it. And so by mentioning these unexpected, undeserving type of people, Matthew's continuing to build anticipation to where this genealogy might be heading. Who might be coming who's going to fulfil God's promises to bless even the most imperfect, undeserving people? But as well as mentioning the women, there's another quite unusual thing in this genealogy. And that is, you might have noticed, an event gets listed. Look there with me now at verse 11. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Verse 12. After the exile to Babylon. And then we're back into all these names of people. This is unconventional again, right? It's weird. Family trees, we're used to them. They're about who married who and kids and lineage and all that sort of stuff. You don't normally put events in them. But here Matthew inserts the name of an event, the exile. And he actually mentions it twice so we don't miss it. And again, I reckon it's got to do with prompting us about God's promises to create a special people and to put his special king over them. Because as many of you will know, the event, it was uh, the exile, it was an historical event where the Babylonian armies, they came in and they crushed and they conquered and they devastated Israel. They ravaged the land. They raised cities to the ground. They carried thousands and thousands of Israelites off as prisoners and exiles to a foreign land. It was a horrific event. And God brought it on the descendants of Abraham as a punishment for their disobedience. Because you see, despite being Abraham's descendants and despite having David's descendant ruling over them, over and over and over again, they kept deliberately ignoring God. And they kept living as though he didn't exist. And they kept doing their own thing. And so eventually God uh, sent them into exile as punishment. And in so doing, all those promises that God made to David and to Abraham, they were put on hold. Not abandoned, because God doesn't break his word. But during the exile, as punishment, it was as if God pressed the pause button on all those promises he'd made to David and Abraham. Israel weren't a blessed people. They were cursed. They didn't have David's descendant ruling over them. They were ruled over by a foreign king. But what happened in this period of history as it kind of drew to an end at the time of the exile? There began to be this growing sense of expectation as to when God might finally release the pause button. Hey, when's God going to hit play again? Hey, when's he going to create a people who will perhaps always be blessed? Hey, when's this special descendant of David finally going to come? 
And again, you see by mentioning an event, the exile, and by tapping into those sort of expectant questions, this unusual family tree is again generating all this anticipation about where is this all headed? Who might be at the end of it? Look with me at verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Friends, I tell you, for those with ears to hear it, that is a breathtaking conclusion to this passage. Because remember, Christ, it's not just Jesus' name. It's a title. It's a title for the coming king that God promised. It's a title for the one who would rule over God's special people with justice and peace forever. And so you see this genealogy, it has led us to that little baby lying in a manger on that very first Christmas. As humble a birth as you could possibly imagine. And yet the birth of unimaginable greatness. Such is his greatness that the entire history of this planet has been deliberately shaped by God so as to prepare for his arrival. That's what Matthew's getting at there in verse 17 about the 14 generations from Abraham to David and the 14 from David to the exile, and the 14 from the exile to Jesus, Matthew's making the point that it's all been perfectly crafted by God, symmetrically, systematically, all worked out in preparation for the birth of this baby. Such is his greatness. Friends, can you see the big idea that Matthew wants us to feel in these opening verses? This is not just a simple family tree with some weird names. It's a history of the world according to God. And according to God, it is all about Jesus. All of history has been deliberately shaped by God for the coming of Jesus. He is at the very centre of all of God's plans and purposes. You know, in that Christmas uh, preparation checklist we looked at before, I don't know if you noticed, but it said that three weeks before Christmas... That's the ideal time to send out your Christmas letters. You know those letters, the ones I'm talking about, where people kind of summarise what the year's been like for them? Where they went for holiday this year? How little Johnny's been going in his soccer team? How little Mary's been coming along in her violin lessons? Got any of those letters? Maybe you've written a few yourself this year, not sure. I reckon those letters are real interesting because... They give you an insight into what, things people, uh, into what people think are the things that matter most in their life. I mean, in a Christmas letter, you can't possibly talk about everything. Like, hey, that's what Facebook's for. But <laughs> in a Christmas letter, you've got to be a bit more selective, don't you? And I reckon it's really interesting to see what sort of things people include. It's an insight into what sort of things really matter. Friends, what we've seen today is that according to God, what matters most, it's the stuff to do with Jesus. God shaped all of history in preparation for his arrival. He is that important. As far as God's concerned, everything revolves around Jesus. And friends, isn't that what we, isn't that what we want to be like as well? We want to be a church where everything that we do revolves around Jesus. We want to be a church where all that we do is systematically, symmetrically, all worked out so as to point to him. 